Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to just put the microphone here. Everyone can hear me at the back. Sounds great. Um, yeah, data-driven access. Um, so before I get into the, uh, the meat of this presentation and what we're going to be talking about, just a little intro of me. Um, so yeah, who am I? Um, that's what I generally like to do during the summer on weekends when I inevitably on a Monday call my boss and say I've damaged myself in some particular way. Um, which is uh, downhill mountain biking, so. Um, but I haven't damaged my hands yet, so I'm still good to work. Um, so who am I? I'm uh, 10 years experience in corporate IT. Um, I actually joined the IT world from the Apple Store, where my job title was Lead Genius. Um, I've been, um, so right now I um, work for a company called Cedar. Uh, CEDA. I am an uh, engineering manager of technical operations. A um, few things report up into me, uh, IT and DevOps. Um, we call it cloud engineering, but I thought I'd just, you know. Um, so yeah, so CEDA is a healthcare technology company, uh, modernizing healthcare provider billing systems. Um, don't let the accident fool you, I am from the UK, but I live in Denver. And despite working for a healthcare company, I still do not understand the US system, um, which is why I'm glad we do what we do. So, <laughs> um, one of my credentials for talking about this today, uh, because as you can see, I am the evil manager word. Um, well, I've lived the journey across a wide range of IAM technologies. Uh, from a company that had a custom database abstraction with multiple feeds to Active Directory, LDAP, a custom shibboleth implementation that you had to write XML to get new um, uh, providers added um, to where we are with Cedar today, which is kind of a, we've got all the toys, uh, an Octane implementation with all the best case scenarios. So this journey from you know what it used to be to what we have now is um, made me really passionate about access, IAM and, and uh, SSO and stuff like that. So. Um, so yeah, um, what else? I've got ADHD, which means I've been freaking out about this talk for two months and finished it about 15 minutes ago. Um, and as this is my uh, first ever conference talk, other than you two, only two others have seen this, my wife and my dog, uh, my dog Bobby. Um, she didn't have much to say about this, um, but I thought if this sucks, at least I put a picture of my dog up, um, so you can't be mad at me. Um, my wife's reaction, um, you know, she usually reacts when I tell her an intricate detail about something she doesn't care about. Sounds great. Um, but then she came back and was like, wait a second, this seems obvious. Why, doesn't, why does it take my company so long to terminate user accounts and remove access and stuff like that? So um, onto the talk, I guess. Um, so yeah, what is it? What, what do I see data-driven access as? Um, so in short, data-driven access gives you time, gives you resources, and removes the burden of access from IT over to the people equipped to make those decisions. Um, we use as much data as we can to drive automated access decisions, and then we fill in the gaps um, using delegated access management to empower system owners to grant access to the tools they own. Um, so what are, what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to basically go through a journey of our IAM stack and the lessons that we learn from implementing it. Um, if some of this seems obvious, then that's great. Um, but if you come back, if you come away with even one thing from this talk, then I think we're good. I think we're successful. Um, I was actually at Octane a couple of years back and uh, was watching a similar talk from, from Netflix and I was like, this seems obvious. And then um, they mentioned one thing that actually uh, completely filled a huge hole in my offboarding strategy. So that was definitely worth it. Um, I don't know if some of you are looking at this and you know we're going through some of the tools that we use and being, you're thinking this is impossible. Um, you know, I'm hoping to show that there are ways to you know manipulate the tools into doing what you need them to do. Um, I don't want this to be a sales pitch for any specific tool. Um, there are loads of tools out there. I can't talk about specific ones, I'm, but I'm hoping to provide some inspiration for what you're using. Um, 
hoping this isn't a brag. Um, I've been where you are. So um, yeah, let's look at the Cedar, like a lightweight view of Cedar stack. Um, so I've put perfect in quotations um, because I think that we all know that, you know, uh, we're always gonna see what needs to be fixed and what needs to, and what, what is broken. But I was at the Spear last night and saw a pixel out because that's what I'm like. So I just put that picture there because it kind of reminded me of what, you know, perfect actually is. Um, but I'm gonna go through this stack, talk about the tools, um, try and give you some ideas that can relate to your environments. Um, at Cedar, we tell prospective candidates, we, you know, one good thing about working here is we have all the toys um, provided you make a good use case for it, use them to their fullest, we're, we're, we're happy to, you know, use a tool, an effective tool for, for the use case. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'll start with our source of truth. Um, and I've heard this sometimes that Active Directory is our source of truth. LDAP is our source of truth. Um, I am of the uh, belief that something like a HR system is a source of truth. Um, and really, um, HR systems are, you know, kind of a big deal. Um, they're the systems that get people paid. So there's a lot of control there. There's a lot of auditability. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, actual control in how you grant that access. So I always want to start with um, a HR system as a source of truth. Um, and when we try and get the data from a HR system, I'm, I'm kind of saying that we're looking to get as much data resolution as possible. Um, so some examples of like, you know, what I class to be good layers of data resolution. You know, we've got the easy stuff, name, department, title, who your manager is. Um, you know, medium stuff, location, office. Um, people are remote nowadays. Knowing if they're remote is actually really important. Um, to some of the more kind of esoteric examples that really do help you with automation. Um, are they a people manager? You know, job title is not enough to judge if someone is a people manager. Um, sometimes you have to say, does this person have more than one person re report or more than zero people reporting into them? If so, they're a people manager. They could have manager in their job title, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a people manager. Um, and we use um, Rippling at Cedar, and I think that the, the manager question was actually really key for us getting involved with the people team to um, pick a decent system that we could, you know, automate off of. Because we kind of, you know, I sold it as a, well, we can add managers to all of the email groups, to all of the Slack groups, to all of the things that they need to use from day, you know, from, from day zero. Like, wouldn't that be cool? You don't have to open tickets. Um, so I think like, you know, our goal is for someone to have access to all the core systems they need from day zero. Um, so for me, um, you know, it was really important to uh, relate that to the HR system, HR to the HR team, the, the people team. Um, so. That was a very, very like, quick kind of look at the source of, of, of truth. Um, but I'm going to go back to that in a second. Um, I also want to talk about source of data. Uh, because um, I think that you may also hear that Oct like we use Okta. I think you might also hear that that is a source of truth. Um, but I don't see it that way. Um, and for um, a few different reasons, um, I think that you know, modern IDP should have a lot of these features. Um, but a rich tool set of rules and automations and things that come out of the box that will let you actually um, drive some of the key automations off that source of truth data um, is really important in a source of data. And I also think that, you know, source of truth is designed to be mutated in the actual, you know, source itself. Um, a source of data, we can build integrations outside of it. Um, so I'm going to go into some examples of kind of what we've done to leverage Okta as a source of data and, and what, you know, you could potentially do as well if you have a source of data that has a API. 
Um, so yeah, let's look at some examples of that. I've got a pretty good um, example here. Um, so this is an example of changing our source of data outside of Okta. If Okta was our source of truth, we wouldn't be able to change it outside of you know, what is already existing. Um, so this is an example of uh, if someone's on call, um, we run a Lambda um, on a schedule that pings the PagerDuty API. Is this person on call? Um, yes. So, you know, add them to an Okta group, hit the Okta API, add them to an Okta group, and put them into the on-call group. That then fires a bunch of rules that essentially say, okay, this person's on call, they get added to a Slack group, which gives them the handle of on call. They get added to a, uh, to a um, AWS group, which elevates their access while they're on call, um, which you know I think is a is a a good way of automating um, and and keeping our access as low as possible, but having an automation that elevates it if needed. Um, so. These downstream systems, um, AWS, Slack, are we using a bunch of like API integrations within Okta? Not really. Um, we're just doing a lot of rule logic in Okta. Um, and I think this is one of the things that I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, there are vendors out there that promise hundreds of custom integrations. Um, and they're, uh, you know, they, they, they do have a high value. Um, I always think that you should try and do what you can in your platform um, because if you have to change vendor, if you have to change to a different system, the rules will still exist and can be easily changed and modified. You know, the vendors out there that, that will do a hundreds and thousands of different integrations, like when we looked at that vendor, it was about the same cost as an engineer. Um, and I don't think that we have an engineer working 38 hours a week on this. Um, but your situation, it may work. But for us, um, the rule logic works really well. Um, now, it does rely on the downstream application being a very good SSO citizen. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, but if you have that and the rules provide all the access you need, then you can go even further. We do kind of more advanced rule logic. Um, this is something that I've called uh, exclusion groups. Exclusion groups um, let you use the Okta rule logic to say, if the person is a member of this group and also not a member of an exclusion group, then you can grant access. If they are an exclusion group, don't grant access. And we have situations where a user might be in an exclusion group because they're in a different country. Um, they can't access the data outside of the US. Or if something happens and we have to limit access, we can build models out of those exclusion groups to reduce access without removing the person from, from Okta. Um, so you can take rule logic, and this is in Okta, but you know, look at your IDP, look at your system to see how far you can take rule logic because um, you can go pretty far with it. And obviously, source of truth, all of these items can be used in rule logic, and that's how we get a Boolean that gives, you know, makes someone a manager, and they get added to those groups and Slack groups and things. Um, be careful, a bit of caution. Um, I was cleaning up my own mess last week because um, I was using a manager field. Manager fields can change a lot easier than like a department. We have like a really good process for departments. If a manager leaves the company, then you have to clear that mess, which is what I was doing last week, um, because it's a lot uh, quicker for someone to leave the company than it is to change the department. So a word of warning, if you are using you know, fields to automate, be careful of using manager, job title, things that can change easy. Um, because yeah, you'll be cleaning up a mess like I did. Um, employee lifecycle. Uh, this is one that you know, I think that we're particularly proud of. Um, and again, this is using um, Okta's built-in uh, additional um, workflows. Um, when I joined Cedar, um, 
Onboarding used to be you know, the responsibility of the IT team. A lot of manual work, a lot of tickets, granting access, doing a lot of things uh, to get people into systems. Um, offboarding used to be a 40-step manual process. Um, every time someone left the company, that was a process that was prone to errors. Um, you know, it, it took a lot of time. Um, we as a company need to be HIPAA compliant, so we had to solve this. And um, this is a very dense diagram, um, but I really want to kind of, you know, show what you can do. And this is in Okta's workflow module. Um, when it comes to offboarding someone um, or onboarding somebody, um, just some very quick, you know, looks at the onboarding process. Um, we are able to uh, take, consume a onboarding request from the HRIS, so nobody's creating the account manually. The HRIS does that when somebody starts. Uh, in Okta workflows, we start to um, create, uh, we use some of the built-in modules to create a system of record, um, to start logging what applications that person has access to. And then we even have custom API steps as well of the onboarding. Um, so I think like one cool thing that one of my team implemented a couple of weeks back was a API call to purchase a Google license. If we don't have any Google licenses, buy the license for that person. That's all automated. And then evidence generation at the end because we are kind of responsible for being audited. Um, the offboarding process, 40 different offboarding steps have been kind of condensed into this um, uh, flow, which again is um, IT is not responsible for offboarding somebody. Um, we're not getting pinged and being like, hey, this person's leaving. Can you make sure to deactivate their account on this date at this time? We get an API call from our HR system, and at the appropriate time, they're offboarded. Um, and then this executes. Um, I think some really cool things from this, um, which is, uh, you know, offboarding is never nice, but there are some interesting things here. Um, so after the Okta workflow step, um, we reach out to different systems depending on what makes sense. So um, Okta's logic for offboarding Google licenses isn't as good as another tool that we use called Lumos, which I'll go into in a second. Um, uh, so we make an API call to Lumos to do a more robust Google offboarding process. You have to keep a license active for 30 days, and then we have to remind people after that time. I don't think we're quite perfect there, but that's the, that's the vision. Um, and then we uh, hit a system called Retriever. If that person is remote, um, then we will hit a service called Retriever, which sends a box and a label to that person to send their um, um, item back. And that saved hours of uh, my team being in um, uh, my team being at FedEx sending boxes to people for them to send their machines back. So um, really, really useful there. Um, I'm sure if you can think of any other systems that you can make a custom API call to, then you can extend like what it is your system does. Um, final step of the process, um, delegated access management. So this is one of the things that I'm also really passionate about. Um, you know, who is providing access to your systems? So we've done the data, we've got as much birthright access as possible. Um, we've done the automations where possible. Now, you know, not every tool is um, something that someone should have access from day zero. So who is granting that access? Is it IT? Are they equipped to do that? Like, do they understand the level of access that they're granting? Do they have to run around and, and get approvals and you know get that those kind of things or can we move that over to a uh, delegated access management system um, like a system like figma like you know our design team knows who needs access to figma I don't I have no idea designers I guess um, but they as owners of the system will know who needs access uh, people can request access that can get approved by a manager and then that access is granted 
upon acceptance. So no tickets being created. Um, we use a tool called Lumos, um, which is a pretty good tool uh, to do this. Um, but I think that once we introduced Lumos for access requests, we dropped our IT tickets by about 2,000 over the course of a year, um, which was huge for the team. Um, so yeah, um, so that's like a really quick rundown of um, our stack and you know where we've come to and some of the challenges we've gone through. Um, but yeah, as I said, I know change is hard. Um, we had to, you know, get to this point. It was a journey. Um, and this wasn't intended to be a brag about, you know, oh, how great we are or whatever. Um, when I joined Cedar, we had a uh, kind of semi-automated system where um, the HR system didn't integrate with anything. Um, and the HR, the people team had to drop a Google, like a, a CSV onto a Google Drive, which would then be consumed by a Lambda and then fed into the Okta API. Um, so um, we didn't have delegated access management, 40 step manual offboarding process. So all of these things we've had to, um, you know, come across, uh, get over to get to where we are today. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to finish this out with some of the challenges that, that I am very aware of. Um, SSO, probably hear from vendors. Yeah, we do, we do SSO. It was actually mean <laughs> to do SSO. Now, this is a polite slide. In my internal meetings, it's a lot more sweary and angry. Um, but, you know, this is some of the problems you can have with what constitutes SSO. Like, you have to have the enterprise plus plus super mega OMFG plan, um, or you have to, um, uh, you know, SSO tax. Um, we do SAML login, we don't do provisioning. So, you know, is your team buying a system where somebody's gonna have to create individual users? Um, you know, we, we do provisioning, we don't do group sync. So they're gonna have to move them into groups manually. Um, I've actually been on calls with vendors telling them how to implement SSO. Um, and it's surprising how many don't. <laughs> um, so, um, I understand that SSO can be a big problem, especially if you're getting requests from teams to, I want this tool, I need this tool. Um, so some tips really, uh, you know, be involved with procurement. Um, it's not the most interesting thing, but you have to be in the step um, to help the teams understand, you know, why what they might want is going to cause problems, um, you know, if they have a system that needs 400 people in it, explain why they're gonna to have to have the enterprise plan um, or they're gonna to have to try another vendor. Um, but also work with them and you know, how many, is it a critical system? How critical is the data? How many users does it have? Does it have five people and it's like not that critical? Then maybe the team can manage it themselves. And I think that, you know, what we've seen from a lot of the automations that we've done previously is that if we have to build a custom feed, then maybe we can. Is the implementation cost going to be worth it? I'm not sure, but it's very, you know, building a Lambda that consumes an API that drops an SFTP file onto a, onto a drive, it, you know, is, is, is possible. Um, so you can, you know, get around it. Don't accept that you're going to have to go in and manually provision each user. Um, I would, you know, hate for, for us to have to do that. Um, the glorious world of HR systems. I tried to find a, you know, the most modern HR system I could that is about right. Um, but yeah, as we said previously, um, I know the pain of <laughs> struggling with bad HRS systems. Um, and that was really what got me involved with our people team to make the choice of rippling and to understand, you know, if we had more capabilities, we could help them even more. Um, and before that, we, we had to make do and do this Lambda that, you know, consumed a CSV file, dropped it onto Google Drive. 
It wasn't perfect, but it did also kind of put the pain over to our people team, which meant they were also invested in helping us uh, get that done as well. Um, and I think like as well, changes, you know, it can also come from within. Um, really proud of my team that are not accepting how things are. You want your teams to be lazy. You want them to ask, why am I doing this over and over again? This makes no sense. You know, empower your team to, to not be helpless um, and then give them, you know, support to go beyond whatever can be done in the UI. Can they code something custom? You know, um, I'm really proud that we've got a fantastic team that are growing into engineers by asking these questions. Um, and a lot of what you saw was actually executed by the team. I'm just here taking the credit for it because I'm the M word. Um, so we wouldn't be where we were without the team. Um, and get the data, you know. If you're spending, let's say, if you're spending X time at FedEx shipping boxes, then if you're getting a system that does that automatically, then you're gonna save Y amount of, uh, of, of time. Um, and yeah, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, I hope that you've taken something away from this today. If you have, I'll consider it a success. Um, Data-driven automation gives you time, resources, and removes the burden of access from IT um, over to people that can make those decisions. Um, look at the tools you have. Uh, do you need the all singing, all dancing, 100 integration application management platform, or can you do something with what you've got with a simple API call? Um, and uh, how can you make more from the data that you already have if you do have a good linkage with a system, can you use that data to make and to do more automation? Um, so yeah, thanks for letting me talk about this <laughs> and uh, showing up. I really appreciate it. Ready for some questions then? Yeah. Anyone have any questions? All right. Hi there. Um, how do you handle a source of truth that is a little too malleable, like people have too much access to change things, or um, it doesn't tie directly into like spending or earning? Because I know you mentioned that at the start. Yeah, I think this, I actually heard someone ask this question last night as well uh, when I was kind of pitching this. So you like you're saying that your HR system is too malleable. Yes. <laughs> um, I you know I think like that's tricky, right? And do I have a good answer for you other than to get involved with the team and explain why this is a problem? And, um, you know, if, if that is something that you are using as a source of truth, then it needs to be truthful, right? And not easily change because um, get involved with the team. Um, if they are doing things like departmental changes, get involved with putting a process behind that so they inform you if they change that. Um, because, yeah, you don't want them, oh, we'll just change the department, and then everyone loses access. Um, and I think we've done pretty well there, but there's definitely work to do. Um, yeah, I wouldn't consider a source of truth to be that malleable, but apparently it's the case. <laughs> so. This is really good stuff, great presentation. You showed... Um towards the beginning of your presentation, a flowchart where you had a mapping defined between a person that is on this team at this time, right, their on-call needs to inherit this access by being in these groups, right? So I, we kind of think of that as a mapping between who you are and what job you have and what permissions you inherit. Now, I think the one that you showed was relatively simple, right? It had about three outputs, but in a more complex enterprise, you might have 10, 15, 20 outputs, right? So how do you take care of managing those mappings if, you know, your Okta crashed and lost everything, right? Or you got hit by a bus, right? Like how do you reconstruct all of that stuff for somebody that's not involved in this process? One, one thing I didn't show during this presentation um, was uh, I've kind of, and, and I didn't show it because we haven't fully implemented it yet, but the, I've got a document about basically making namespaces. So um, there's a uh, philosophy, well, yeah, at least a philosophy of this is the type of, you know, a, a app colon application name colon access level. That's the kind of 
group that has access to the application. And then you have an account collection that will drive that. And then you have like exclusion groups, EX, colon, et cetera. So um, I didn't put that into this presentation because uh, I thought it'd be a bit too dense, but um, I have got a doc that I'm working on to try and show that in more uh, and I, but I want my team to also implement it before I start to shout about how uh, cool it is. Uh, but yeah, like a basically, I'm, I'm making like namespaces with Octa groups. Hey, uh, nice presentation. Um, I think that the you need to have a certain amount of maturity in the company for doing things like this. What do you think about all the groups that are involved in this for, because maybe IT is, uh, has more maturity than HR or processes internally, what do you think? Yeah, I think like as well, um, I'd say it's like obviously our implementation isn't perfect. There's definitely stuff that's in IT, like that's in Okta that, that needs to be cleaned up, tech debt. Um, I think that we've kind of matured at the same rate as our people team. And um, if that isn't the case, then, you know, I think that um, work to, I, I know I keep saying it, I know it sounds, you know, um, rich, but work with them to understand that. Like, if you can get this right, then all of this stuff that frustrates you, we can automate it. And I keep going back to like email groups. Like, we're not there, we're not perfect on the email groups yet, but they understand that, like, if we can get more data, I can, they're not going to have to add people into a Google group. They're not going to have to automate that um, offboarding. They're not going to have to create a ticket for IT to offboard people, right? They can handle that themselves. They're not going to have to try and find an IT person to do it. Um, yeah, I think like, and maybe that maybe we're lucky with that that our people team have matured at kind of the same rate. Um, but yeah, as I said, like try and sell the what can happen if you get it right. Any other questions? All right. So uh, in my organization, we're. Uh, starting an exercise about relabeling our da data with, you know, the evolution of, of PII laws. Um, do you have any sort of like in systems or mappings in your, um, in this infrastructure to, to sort of say, okay, this is something that needs, you, I think you mentioned needs to stay in the US yeah. or otherwise, and, and how did you go about that? Um, I think we go off standard HIPAA, um, the, the systems, it's basically, I think, standardized with HIPAA, which is, you know, green systems are, do, do not contain, P, you know, PHI, um, yellow systems could be, um, and I'm looking at Aaron, because <laughs> red systems do have um, uh, PHI in them, and we do have to control access. <laughs> Yeah, this was uh, one of the early things that we did from the security side and not the IT side, was try and simplify access down to red, yellow, green. Um, uh, maybe haven't explained it perfectly, uh, but uh, uh, red is uh, sensitive patient data, yellow is sensitive data that is not patient data. So this will be employee data, financial data, things like that. And green is lunch menus, I don't care if it's on the internet. Um, your team, you know, obviously each company is different in terms of the access levels that they need to do, but we focused on just that really simple, like red, yellow, green traffic light thing to start. Um, and there are, in fact, rules in Okta named, you know, red US only, red, and so on. And we can use the Okta rules to map team constraints and application constraints to those, um, those labels. Thank you. <laughs> So the, the kiss, keep it simple, silly. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes. So 
So, I mean, great perspective on data-driven access, right? And and one of the things that um, we always speak to when we uh, talk about access is entitlements. Um, and the way entitlements feed into your entitlements repository and the way they branch out into the systems, there is always a delay component involved, right? I mean, so, you know, maybe your entitlements refresh happens overnight, flows to downstream, downstream systems maybe the next day, whatever, right? So. How do you uh, bridge the gap between the time, you know, an access is supposed to be revoked, um, you know, till it gets to your entitlement repositories and those individual entitlements are truly reflected down, right? Because to avoid failures such as bad connections from somebody or, you know, too many unauthentic, unsuccessful attempts because, hey, that service ID is still tied to that person in, um, you know, your system of record and that causes trouble down the line. So how, what, what's your, uh, I mean, is there, I mean, given the cloud approach, I think it's more cloud centric, but is there a magic bullet to do? I think that goes back to the uh, SSO, being a good SSO citizen. Um, and I don't think everything's perfect there. So if all else fails, we obviously do remove login by losing SSO and you can't log in without that. Um, but if an application is a good SSO citizen, Okta is really good at essentially when that person's access is revoked, it will fire SIM calls for every person, that, every application that person had access to, which if your application is a good SSO citizen, it will remove that access. Um, and I think that we're all, we also, the security team have done a really good job um, with Lumos as a delegated access management platform, which has a, also a temporary amount of access time. So we do just-in-time access for AWS access um, elevation. And that also does the same thing where, because it's a good citizen, it removes the access um, when that time is, is, is up. But it's not perfect. There are systems that people still exist in. But uh, fortunately for the most important ones, it does actually remove access. Any other questions? I'm glad you left a decent amount of time yeah, for questions. Right. <laughs> Everyone wanted to know more. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for your talk and um, big round of applause, everyone. <laughs>